which also uh, of the char character, I'm talking about the mother, right? Which also the character is not something minor. It must be something crucial for them if they are writing about this type of character. Three, uh, three plays. We have uh, a new play. Uh, the last play will be uh, um, also a play in which mothers play an essential role for the whole uh, conflict that takes place. So I, when I was uh, reading the, the anthology, I didn't necessarily thought of the, you know, repeating uh, plays that pertain to this more or less the same, the same topic. It wasn't like that. I was looking for plays that would be more readable um, that would allow me to discuss topics and issues, and that I thought we could we could do them. Okay, um, and then I was selecting them according to more or less can we do this in class? That was the criterion. The criterion, and I ended up with these four plays. Okay, um, I like to. Um, uh, show you my share my screen for a sec here because I would like to start as always with uh, reminding us as to what we are doing. So we are reading, uh, discussing the play by Diana Rasnovich, Dilemon. I asked you also to uh, watch a TED talk by uh, Roxanne Gay. And the title of that specific tech talk is uh, Bad Feminist. I also ask you to contribute to the forum. And this is a requirement for the class in terms of participation, right? Contribute to the forums. Um, then notice what I'm doing, uh, asking for you for uh, Thursday. It's an ambitious um, goal of mine. And I, I know I'm gonna uh, go humbly about it. So for, for Thursday, what I'm saying is, let's start working on the altarpiece of Yumbel. Okay, that's the way you say the, the word, Yumbel, Yumbel. You, if you, okay, Yumbel. Um, but I'm not saying to you, read the play. Notice what I'm saying, I'm going to repeat it. I'm not saying to you, read the play, altarpiece of Yumbel, no. I'm not saying that. I'm saying only read the segments that I'm highlighting. And those, those segments are called episodes, okay? So I'm only asking you to read the episodes and at the beginning, the, for, for Thursday, okay? Uh, and I give you the page. Episode one goes from page 28 to 32. And then episode two goes from 36 to 39 and so on and so forth mm -hmm. until you read all the episodes <laughs> and you will see it's it's like a story by itself that goes from episode to episode until the end so that's why i would like you for you to begin with with that with those episodes okay i hope to have some time to to focus on uh the other piece of Yumbel. so we'll have a mix uh of conversations for Thursday. We'll be talking about dilemma, right? Finishing the play. And we'll start talking about the altarpiece of Yumbel, which is the longest play, by the way, that we will read this, this semester. And it will be the last one, okay? The last one before I ask you to do your monologues. Uh, and I will make sure to talk more about monologues on Thursday. Um, Okay, so um, any uh, so I should have uh, your report, right? Uh, that was part of the assignment for evening walk. The second report should have been submitted. And I'll take a look at them and I will send you my feedback, comments plus grade for the report. Any questions so far? For the last report, I got it back, but I didn't see a grade for it. That's odd. Okay, uh, you need to look at the very bottom, right? The end of the, 
of the play, I mean, of the report, because I, that's what I did. Okay, I'll check it again. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I can check it ag again myself, okay? But I'm pretty sure I, I put always the grade at the end, at the end of the report. Um, okay, so I have a question for you, but before I have a question, I have, uh, let me take a look if somebody's trying to be admitted. I don't see anybody, it seems. Okay, no more people trying to be admitted. Um, I would like to create a couple of breakout rooms and give you a question to deal with or a little task, okay? Um, the, the, the question will be, what does the word absurd absurdity means to you? Okay, that's the question for the group. What does the word absurd, absurdity means to you? And the task. The task is to come up with an example of an absurd situation. What would be for you a good example of an absurd situation. Okay, so here we go. I'll create the breakout rooms. Absurd meaning ridiculous, like absolutely ridiculous, like, like also non-believable. Yeah. Like I hear in crime dramas where they accuse someone, they're like, that's absurd. Yeah, I kind of think the same way, like as like something um, wrong or not natural at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you will need to come up with a situation, an example, or more than one example to clarify the meaning of the word, right? Mm -hmm. What about... And the actual definition says wildly unreasonable, inappropriate, illogical. So. Yeah, that's what I found. But I mean, it's it's ultimately I mean, what we had said. Discussed, yeah. Yeah. Yes, and now you need if you have the definition, and if you're agreeing on the definition, uh, please uh, uh, come up with an example or two. What would be a good situation that would you know, clarify the meaning of the word, what would be a situation for you that would be truly absurd? Okay. As, as opposed to horrific, for example, right? right. As, a, as opposed to comedic or, or something like that. Hmm. Flat earthers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I guess also like, Kind of think of something like super unreasonable. What about people who actually don't believe in in the coronavirus? Yeah, just like people that don't believe in any like medicine. 
medical technology and they just think right yeah i agree with that uh, probably you will you will have to explain why why the situation uh, rings absurd to you right at the same time what makes it absurd in what sense uh, Also, you could just say, like, if someone just, like, if you were, like, the sky's blue, and they just, like, they're, like, no, even though you have, like, absolute proof, and they just, like, don't believe you. Yay, we didn't get kicked out. No, I'm just trying to be as careful as possible. You know that I'm kind of playful with my buttons here, with my things that I need to click on. I get too enthusiastic after a while. Well, um, I think that uh, I gave you the question about absurdity uh, because I think this, this experience is truly contemporary and it probably pertains, well, not probably, it pertains to the experience of many people uh, during the 20th century. The word became prominent, prominent I think, uh, like in the 30s, 30s 1930s. Um, so almost as, as, you know, a century back, and many, many uh, writers be be uh, began to talk about absurdity and how absurdity was important for what they were writing. And this could be, and there is a, a strong tradition of uh, plays in particular that address uh, absurdity through the way they, the plays have been composed, arranged, uh, and the dialogues that take place and, and the conflicts that take place, as you know, you know, without conflicts, we don't have this place. So um, the background of, of absurdity was actually the wars, the world, uh, you know, wars that number one, I would say number two, that led to, to people in Europe in particular to feel very, um, what is it? Disappointed is the, is the least I can say, but um, uh, they, they, they felt like uh, reality was not making sense, okay? And, and if you think about the Nazi regime, right? And all that took place, then, then the confrontation we had, our, uh, the Soviet Union and the United States in this kind of clash, right, historic clash <coughs> uh, coming out of the Second World War, there was, a, there was the sense that something deeply wasn't making sense, but it was at the level of the person, right, individual, as well as the level of, this, of society. And one main writer that became famous for the, uh, uh, I, I guess for the literature of the absurd, it's Franz Kafka. In case you haven't heard that name, I will uh, mention it again. Franz Kafka, uh, who did not write plays. He wrote amazing short stories and deeply tro troublesome uh, novels, okay? With, uh, when he, uh, where he used the last absurdity to, to express, convey, the sentiment, if you will, of his uh, contemporaries. Now we're talking about here Dilemma, right? And this is a play written by a person from Argentina, a woman, and it's fairly more recent. Um, but for us to understand the play, I don't think we can understand it unless we talk a bit about absurdity and what it means to us before, at least before we start um, um, reading the play. So can you, can you tell me what is your definition of, uh, Megan, could you help us out by telling us what is your definition of absurdity, absurd, basically, for a yeah. synonym? 
Uh, we said that it was something just very like outlandish with very unreasonable. Uh, okay, I heard unreasonable, very unreasonable. Like outlandish. And what else? Outlandish. Okay, thanks. I couldn't hear you. Outlandish. Yeah, like uh, very out there. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, it, it seems to that if you if we say unreasonable, it seems to me that there is something reasonable, right? There is something reasonable for us, and if that is reasonable, I guess it must be we can understand it because it follows a kind of uh, logic that makes sense to us. Although that's well, I'll complicate that, but I think I think that uh, yeah, I. It's also, um, well, let's see what else. Do we have more synonyms? Kaylee, do, did you find any synonyms, any, any other synonym for absurdity, absurd? Um, I think Megan kind of said what we said in our group. Okay. Anybody else who could like, could add one more synonym? Okay, if we don't have anybody else, uh, Jorge, what was your example for absurdity, a situation that was absurd? And can you explain why that would be absurd for you? I guess it could be like with people who doesn't believe um, on situations like the coronavirus right now. So like, why would there it is, be absurd? Huh? Why would that be absurd? Because if you look around the world with all the news and all the people have who have died, there's so much proof, and then you're gonna say that that is not real. Okay. Okay. Uh, so there are facts, and there must be evidence to prove that things are happening, right? Yeah. And if you don't. Um, acknowledge that evidence and you take, take not into account the facts, then maybe you're going against reality and therefore um, you are adopting a, a position that for many people would look like absurd, illogical, uh, unreasonable to use the same, the same uh, words that uh, we were using before. Could somebody give us another example? I'm going to ask uh, Kels. An example? Yeah. One more example. Um, an example I was thinking of is like when someone's in court and um, they're trying to like prove them guilty or something and then like they say they don't have an alibi or something and they say that's absurd, you know? Um, what is absurd in that situation that they don't have an alibi? Mm -hmm. uh, well, they said that they don't have an alibi, but the person thinks they have an alibi, so they find it absurd. Oh, uh, so uh, uh, the person who is being uh, accused of something has an alibi, but the, the rest of the court does not trust that that's truly an alibi? Yes. Can I go off of Kelsey's? Uh, Please do, because uh, no, like, it's hard with my roommate. No, you're fine. Uh, well, like, you could say that maybe, like, the alibi was absurd. So you could say that maybe they said at 10 p.m. they were at the bar where this woman was last seen or uh, whatever they'd say, like nine o'clock, they were there. But then at 10, when she went missing, they said, well, we were already in Florida. And they were like, that's absurd because you couldn't get from New York to Florida within the hour. Okay. Um, okay, I just wanted to be precise because 
I was thinking about uh, the word lie to lie to somebody, lying to somebody. And I was trying to see if we could distinguish between lying, right? And absurdity, okay? That's, that's I, and I guess as Megan is, is describing or giving us the, an example, um, or a description of the example, I think he's, she's emphasizing also the, the, the response from, from this person, it's illogical because it doesn't, doesn't add up, right? It doesn't add up. And in that, in that regard, um, then we have the sentence, that is absurd, that is absurd. Um, yeah, there is something incongruent when we talk about absurdity and 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 we and we react right in a specific manner pertaining to that incongruity um, the complication the, the the philosophical complication if you will is that we deal with a lot of incongruity or things that make no sense and when when people in europe um were exposed to the atrocities of war, the desperation of having to flee from places, the overwhelming destruction of lives and cities and projects, you know, individual projects, uh, projects of entire societies that were demolished. Um, and also the basic, the basic, basic, basic uh, sense that us as human beings, you know, we respect each other, so I treasure Jimena's life, right? I, I will not hinder the development of uh, her life. When I do so, uh, as uh, such an extreme, uh, uh, in such an extreme, extreme manner as it took place, say in the Second World War, then it seems that what we are, uh, people started uh, uh, asking themselves, what are we here for? Uh, just to lead to the demise of our uh, people or really to help each other and make sure that life is meaningful for all of, of us. Um, so there were major developments in, in Europe, in the United States, uh, all over the place. And the philosophical existentialism, uh, you know, came to be as part of this reaction against absurdity. The absurdity, of course, is historical, as you can see, right? It has roots in deeply in conflicts that took place. So it's not simply uh, just because, you know, I go to the cashier machine and the, 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 the ATM, I'm sorry, and then all of a sudden the ATM doesn't give me cash, that this is absurd, okay? I'm saying that this is more meaningful in the sense that uh, there is a, a clash of uh, cultures, if you will, destruction, decimation of people that lead um, writers to feel that they have to question our notions of reality and also our notions of humanity. Uh -huh. um, so uh, in addition, at the beginning, I, I said, this is something that people, contemporary people have felt more and more. Let me give you one more example that I'm thinking of right now. The atomic bomb. Why would that be, and not, not just the atomic bomb, but the fact that we send an atomic bomb to a location, we make it explode, and we decimate people. Uh, but, once you do that, right, once you have the atomic bomb, there's no going back in terms of humanity. And this was also part of the existential um, philosophical view that things are not making sense. So how do we make sense? At the root of our reality, our lives, things are not making sense. Now, of course, this has to do with uh, a secu secular view of life. Jimena, what does it mean, secular? Um, I'm not sure. Does it mean like, um, like 
segmentized almost? In a sense, it might think that, uh, it might mean that, I'm sorry, uh, secular means that we are no longer attached to religion. Oh, I see, okay. What do I mean by that, actually? Well, let, this, this um, um, has uh, serious implications for our education and the way we are brought up. Why? Because if you, have, if, you, if you go to school nowadays, right, unless you go to a religious school, you're not forced to uh, take classes in religion. That's secular, secularism. Now you on the side, right, can go to your church and participate in religious life because your family it belongs in that tradition. But in terms of education, right, um, the, the, the big development for the 20th century may be that we are secular people, secular people. Therefore, uh, if religion offered, you know, for many people, uh, a reason to keep on going and trust that things are making sense, in the 20th century, uh, in, the, in the 20th century uh, culture, being so secular also uh, had implications for the way people were thinking about their lives. What do I hold on to? if religion will not offer me a solution, okay? If I don't trust in religion. Um, and so how, what, what, how do we make it meaningful? Well, that's the context, okay? That's the context, context uh, the general context for, for, for this play in my view, okay? Because you have two characters, um, basically, Gloria, and you have the substitute mother, and from the beginning, we, we, uh, we go into um, a reality that develops by itself somehow, in the sense that here we have a person who, how old is she, by the way? How old is Gloria? Anybody? She's 30. And this is very important for the play. And notice how uh, being a woman of, and having and being, you know, 30, a 30 year old woman may have cultural implications for the character. It's not that, I mean, we say like in uh, the Mexican tradition, right, we have the quinceañera, a 15 year old, and we will celebrate those, uh, that, uh, that moment in their lives. Um, so there are moments that are maybe important for for the maturation of a person or for, for our maybe decisive moments in terms of their lives. And it seems to me that the play here is hinting at that reality. What happens when a woman you know, turns 30 years old? Um, is there something going on there that will not happen when she turns uh, 20, 25, 40? And, and so that's why I think she shows that age in particular, okay, the writer. Uh, and then we have this woman who comes, help her out. But it's not a very traditional situation because we have um, a woman who comes to her apartment as a substitute mother. And as far as I know, uh, substitute mother do not exist. We could say a stepmom stepmom, right? Um, but not necessarily a substitute. So, um, and then basically we have these conversations between the two characters, right? And we have uh, an introduction to the play when they are getting to meet each other. This is what you do. This is who I am, right? And then um, I would like to talk about the three first roles that they are playing on the stage. We have three different um, moms, and I would say we have kind of three different daughters. And also pay attention to the fact that um, each time they have conversations, they, uh, although we don't have uh, male characters on the, on the stage, they mention men, okay? So men, 
are not on stage, they're absent. But at the same time, they are not that absent, okay? Because they are impacting the lives of the characters. And, and they have very harsh words for men in this play as well. Mm -hmm. um, but don't lose sight of the significance of men in the lives of the women we have, the women uh, that we have on the stage, I would say, at the same time. Um, so let's see what we can do. Let's go to page 218. Uh, I guess page 219, so she's coming in to the apartment, the substitute mother, and Gloria is there wait, has been waiting for her. Um, page 219. Jimena, could, could you please uh, read this as the substitute mother? Um, Megan, could you please uh, read us Gloria? I can't, one second, let me get to the page. <laughs> 219, 219. I would like to examine uh, the conversation they have and how is it that seems, it seems so absurd at times, okay? What makes it absurd in terms of communica communicating something to each other? Okay, who am I reading as again? I'm sorry. Well, I'll say, I forgot, but so I'll say substitute mother and okay. Megan is Gloria. Okay. They told me I was supposed to return from a trip that are you the customer who requested a mother who recently returned from India? No. But aren't you the woman who needed a mother who's fond of riding elephants with a Hindu lover whose ancestor was Gandhi? You're mistaking me for another customer. I never requested such a mother. Someone else must have requested that action. You're right. I got you mixed up with another customer. I apologize, I'm very busy. It doesn't happen to me often, but sometimes I confuse one customer with another and I act out the substitute mother. I act out the sub substitute mother someone else has requested. Forgive me. That mother was requested by Mr. Well, we don't give out names, but he's a gentleman. I have to visit tomorrow. He's addicted to suffering from nostalgia. Oh yes, you, contra you contracted plan G. I've got it written down here. Do you want me to start from the beginning? No, let's continue. Incompetent. I? I've been working as a substitute mother for years. How do you mix up your customers? I scrimped and saved to afford to hire a substitute mother. And for your first scene, you confused me with another customer. Well, it's my job to cause passions to run wild. And I just accomplished it with you. You're extremely jealous of my other customers. Okay, thanks. Excellent. Very well read. Very well read. Thanks a lot. Uh, any comments? What would you like to highlight? What should, do you think we should highlight in this conversation? Well, the fact that, um, again, the word right arises um, absurd, uh, absurdity in which she acts out. Um, she who? Uh, I'm, I'm, excuse me, sorry, the substitute mother. Um, the Hindu rider, the elephant, you know, riding elephants and things like that, that's kind of absurd and ridiculous. <laughs> yes, it seems outlandish. So that's, that's a good... Uh, that's a good example for something absurd. Yes. Uh, now, notice how absurdity may, may take things to an extreme, to an extreme. So that also is maybe one uh, component of absurdity. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, Gloria got Chance to oh, oh sorry. <laughs> uh, I was just gonna say Gloria got really mad at the substitute mother when 
she didn't um, do what she wanted her to do in the beginning. Like she came in and like was a wrong customer that she was playing for. Um, yes, like uh, she becomes demanding, this is what you need to do for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, Lindsay, were you going to say something? I felt that she <clears throat> organized my thoughts. I felt the absurd, absurdity, the ridiculousness of the, in the tone in her voice, like, when the substitute mother asked her, but aren't you the woman who needed a mother who's fond of riding elephants? Gloria's like, that's absurd. Well, right? Uh, yeah, uh, but at the same time, she's saying, do not confuse me. So it's like within the play, um, that may be up to extent true. Okay, there might be, there might be um, uh, a woman or who needed that kind she of mass. She thinks it's ridiculous that that she could be mixed up with other customers. Like she, yes. she thinks she is a special person that shouldn't even be confused with other people. Like I get a feeling of an ego or entitlement. Yes, and that will be very important for the play. Exactly. Um, well, you make me think, Lindsay, of consumer society. Consumer society and the kind of society we live in nowadays, where you pay the for The Karen stuff. society. A consumer. The, the meme of, oh, sorry. Consumer, consumer society. So uh, I pay you to bring me that sandwich. Bring it to me. If I don't, Connor. if I don't think you are bringing me my appropriate sandwich, the one that I requested. Yeah, that sounds like a Karen nowadays. It's it's a meme thing of somewhat of a man or or woman who is so entitled that they go into absurd fits and think that everyone that they're the smartest person in the world and everyone around them is an idiot when they're yeah. not. Uh, yes, I understand what you're saying, yes. Uh, what I also wanted to say is that it's kind of a trivial situation, or, or not trivial, but ordinary uh, situation in the sense that, because Lindsay was men mentioning entitlement, um, then in a consumer society, because I am paying for something, I am entitled to such and such. Um, which makes, uh, makes our, our relations to people, right? Very transactional, very business-like, and they give and take, take and give in, in the economics uh, uh, way of approaching business, you know, way of, of approaching situations. Um, maybe I'm idealizing social relationships in the sense that uh, I would think that, you know, if I am relating to you, I'm relating as a human being, and there is nothing uh, in between that relationship. Maybe I'm too idealistic, but the play is emphasizing that here we have, as, as uh, you read, right? Customer and somebody who's paying as a customer for services. Okay, here we I found the word services. And, and then if those services are not provided, then um, all the money she's saying that I was saving up for this occasion is wasted, wasted. Um, let me ask you a philosophical question. You don't need to answer, but I, I'm just asking the question because the place suggests the question maybe. So is it that we are so, so much into this consumer society and these types of transactions that we cannot have any longer any other conception of our relations to people, okay? I think this, the, 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 the play is suggesting that to me, okay? Um, and then if, if we do that, 
our relationships are, are pretty cold, you know, cold-blooded, cold, um, not warm, the opposite of warm. Because at the center of this relationship, what do we have? Money. Money. Um, now, what do I say that to? Uh, because uh, you've seen that um, when Bill, right, uh, was on a stage, he was desperate for some kind of um, healing from the, his traumatic experience in Vietnam. And he was finding that uh, um, opportunity by establishing a relationship with Rosa, which failed. Okay. But I need in my desperation for, for this relationship to be nurturing and uh, allow me to go to, to, to become like a healthy, mentally healthy person. Then uh, in our um, second play, uh, <laughs> I'm forgetting, uh, in evening walk, we have this contrast and conflict between characters and then they seem not to be communicating very well, right? But then all of a sudden we find out that there was tragedy. And, and when the characters were very close to each other, right? Can I see your baby? No, it's asleep. Can I see your baby? So the writer becomes humanized, right? Um, more affectionate, more interested in the real life of the mother all of a sudden we have this tragedy, but this tragedy also for me uh, implies that we need deep human connection, if you will, right? To help each other heal something that is hidden at times, right? That people will not tell you about because it's too much, like in the case of the mother of our second play. And in, in this case, in this case, um, uh, the substitute mother plays fairly well, you know, uh, although he's, it, it, she seems to be confused about her uh, role according to uh, Gloria. She plays very, uh, very well uh, the role of what this um, professional worker who's come to play a role, right? Uh, you contracted play plan G, it's a, uh, the character says. Ah, you contracted this plan, so this is the way things should should be going. Um, so from the side of uh, from the side of uh, Gloria, we have a business transaction. From the side of the um, substitute mother, oh yes, we do have a business transaction. Let's keep on going. Let's keep on going. Okay. Um, let's let's see. A uh, page to twenty. They keep talking. You know. Uh, just trying to uh, allowing for us to understand what is this kind of situation, messy situation that we are observing. Uh, the entrance you requested um, is a sad cliche. Um, the substitute mother is challenging Gloria's viewpoint. I, uh, Gloria says, I requested you, you make me wait a long time. Um, and this and that and that, I, I wanted this. I and notice I paid for the uncertainty of not knowing whether my mother was coming or not. This is what I paid for. Um, before and after, I always have a lot of customers. Uh, for me, that means that, well, this is kind of ordinary, ordinary, uh, situ ordinary situation for both the mother and, this, uh, and, and Gloria. It looks like there are many people requesting the services, these services. It's not only Gloria, okay, in this reality, right? Of the play, many people are uh, paying for for this this uh, important service. It seems. Um, why would be one question, right? Why is this so socialized? What is happening in this society that people need these services, right? Um, let me see. Um,
there is a, there is a conversation also on page 221 about the name uh, of one of the characters. Uh, the name is Gloria. Okay, Gloria. Um, you name me Gloria, the character is saying, and how could you have given me that kind of name? Mm -hmm. And the mother is saying, well, because you look the you look like the name. Okay. Um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, it seems that when you name somebody, you name you name them because you you think that they will have some kind of destiny and they'll be appreciated by people surrounding uh, your children, right? Um, but Gloria questions that from the beginning. Why do I have this name? Why, in fact, what is why why what what uh, what is it that I am? Okay, um, by 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 you giving me this name, um, and on page two twenty one at the bottom of the page we have the uh, substitute mother changing clothes and becoming the first actually the first uh, role. Uh, and it's, it is stated at the bottom of the page, reproachful mother, reproachful mother. Um, and then immediately, once she's uh, changed clothes, she takes on the role of the character and the voice must change, I guess, because she, she's like full of energy and she becomes someone else. Um, notice one thing. Uh, so what Gloria is paying is for an actor, right? She's paying an actor to come to her house, apartment, apartment, and do this role. So what we have in here, it's truly an actor in, inside the play, right? Um, what is it that actors do? What do we need them for? Um, and so on and so forth. Let's see what the, the first mother... Hmm? Oh, sorry. I think of actors being used as to convince or sell a product like commercials to um, we use convince them. someone <clears throat> to like sell or promote materials. They use actors for that. They use actors for um to convince stories to entertain us they also use actors well like like i said to promote or to sell a product like they also are used for like charities and such like a special spokesperson because I remember like, oh, if the actor says this, then I should do it because I look up to this person. Um, yes, I agree. They, they do all those things. Uh, when the mother changes uh, into the first role, this is what she first says, bottom of page 221. I curse the moment I baptize you. Whatever gave me the idea of, whatever gave me the idea of calling you Gloria, um, I also curse it, mother. Flip the page. With such a name, you do me, do me to, uh, to failure, to failure. Um, let's keep on reading. Jorge, can you help us out? And Kaylee? Yeah, Is it 221? 222. Up on the page. Doing Gloria? Yes, please. And Kaylee, uh, substitute mother. Okay. I also curse it, mother. Which such name you do me to failure? If you had listened to me, you would have married the diplomat you met at your friend's house. That you would really be living in glory. But you married Joe. Joe isn't such a bad guy, mother. He's never worked in his entire life. And he's given you all these kids whom I support. My salary barely pays the rent. Joe, <laughs> where in hell did you find him? Did you win him in a lotto or on the Price is Right? 
You're such an idiot, Gloria. You're nothing like me. Why? Was that any better than Joe? At least he worked. He would spend it on wine. He, but he got drunk with his own money and never asked me for anything. Joe doesn't drink. He takes care of the kid. He's honest. He's another idiot. You're a pair of idiots, and I have to support you. You and your descent. That dis <laughs> descent. Can someone say that right? Descendants. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thank you. They're your grandchildren, mother. My grandchildren, you're my burden. You leave them with me all day long while Joe sleeps. You work and I take care of the children and spend my savings trying to feed you. Some deal. And to top it all off, I named you Gloria. You of all people to be named Gloria. <laughs> okay, let's just stop there. Thanks. Um, so how, how are uh, men depicted in this conversation? What are they like, Megan? Uh, they're both disappointments. Um, yes, it, it seems that uh, Joe Joe is not able to uh, pro to be a, or to become a provider for the family. Mm -hmm. And what was the complication with uh, Gloria's father? He was an alcoholic. Yeah, so it, look, it looks like uh, most, uh, well, women here are those that are uh, sustaining families, mm -hmm. uh, at, at least according to the story, the way it's told. Um, and this is a source of conflict between the two characters, at least these two that we are seeing right now, right? Um, but what is the tone of the mother in this case? What is the tone, the tone that you hear in her voice as she's talking to Gloria, Jimena? Um, I definitely cold. Harsh, cold. Uh, yes, very harsh. Um, and just like, just. She just doesn't want anything to do with anything else. She doesn't want anything to do with um, her grandchildren and things like that. Yeah, and he, he even goes to an extreme on page 23. The substitute mother says, I'm reading now, an idiot like you, poor little Gloria. Mm -hmm. What is that kind of language? What is she doing? Uh, you know, uh, what is she doing to Gloria when she says, an idiot like you? Poor little Gloria. Definitely wounding her, um, mm -hmm. verbally wounding her. And I know that um, she'll definitely take that probably with her. <laughs> she, oh, when, when it's different from hearing things like that from family members and people that are supposed to love you unconditionally. Um, it's a different type of pain, a different type of wound. Yes. and. Uh... Uh, yes, and it must be uh, deeply felt. Uh, on page 223, again, desolation, boredom, putrefaction, and then the other word, right? And those names fit you, but not Gloria. Not Gloria. Um, and, but notice the reaction by Gloria. Um, Kels, could you read the Gloria's reaction here on page 223? So the, the substitute mother, yeah, I'll help you out. Page 223, 223. The substitute mother goes, punishment, desolation, boredom, putrefaction, putrefaction. Those names fit you. And then uh, Gloria says. That's it. It's exactly the type of mother role I requested. You're really good. There you go. So I think it's the opposite reaction of... Uh, normal kind of conversation. What kind of reaction was this, Kaylee? Uh, Gloria is like happy of the way that she's like performing. Yes, and, and then um, this is, it's like saying, this is what I really wanted from you. Now you are, you know, performing 
at perfection. Bravo, fantastic. But notice that it's, it's, uh, this happens, the reaction, precisely when she's most mistreated as daughter. Mm -hmm. So my question here would be, why Gloria is in need of this kind of treatment? Okay. Why, even if it is false, okay, because it's fake, supposedly, right? That she's hired the substitute mother. But what would be the reason or reasons for her to ask her, you know, to perform in this fashion and establish this kind of relationship uh, with her? Maybe her mother um, didn't discipline her as much as she wanted as a child. That could be a, a good a reason, right? I need my discipline. I need to go this way. And I'm finding you guilty of not uh, being as stern, right, as you should have been with me to help me out in life. Yes, that could be a reaction. Notice how psychological the play is also, right? How psychological the play is in, the, in that regard. Um, I wanted to, to highlight the fact that in here we find the one important fact, okay? Uh, when Gloria says, today is my birthday. So, and then, uh, then we have one characterization of the conversation in the end, and I need an explanation for this. Gloria says, I know, I know, but I have had enough masochistic satisfaction, satisfaction for one day. I'm telling you though, today is really my birthday, which is surprising, right? If we're gonna fake it, let's fake it completely. But Gloria is saying, but I'm gonna tell you today, you know, this is, this is something I'm really telling you. It's my birthday. Um, so I need an explanation. What does masochistic uh, mean for you guys? What does it mean? No takers? It's, let me give you a hint. It's the opposite of sadistic. These are antonyms. So we have on one side masochistic, and on the other side we have sadistic. Is someone getting pleasure out of like their own humiliation? Yes, exactly. And the key word you mentioned already, pleasure, satisfaction, enjoyment. But pleasure is the key word, yes. Uh, of course, these are words that were used a lot by uh, the major psycho psychoanalyst, uh, psychoanalyst, Sigmund Freud, right? Sigmund Freud. Um, <clears throat> and uh, notice how psychoanalysis also developed um, in Europe as a result of the wars, right? This, this was a person working with, with people who um, were middle class mostly, and and he was uh, observing what what was happening in their subconscious subconscious minds right not consciousness but subconsciousness what is happening in there okay um so history also in impacts uh, psychology in that regard it always does it always does my little point here but um yes pleasure Obtaining pleasure because you're suffering, because of your pain. Now, then sadistic would be uh, inflicting uh, pain on someone else and gaining pleasure out of that, right? I make you suffer, and then out of that suffering that you are experiencing, I find enjoyment. Uh, I, uh, what is it, a crude, Example of sadistic would be a sadistic, sadistic person for me would be a person who tortures someone else. Sadistic. Okay. Um, so um, on the same page, we we find the a key question also: Are you thirty? And the answer is yes. Um, now, 
one very basic question along the, the play then, and notice that this is one role, right? Because then we have uh, page 224. Let's see when the role changes. Uh, yes, now on page 224, we have the second role. And here, changing clothes, clothes again, the substitute mother will become, what kind of mother? Uh, let's, let's listen to her, okay? Happy birthday to you now, says the mother. How nice, I'm so glad to see you. The dress looks great on you, you're so pretty. I'm very proud of you, my dear Gloria. Mm -hmm. Every day I thank God for the blessing of having such a special mother. Um, you have never, down at the bottom, you have never caused me any problems. You are a fa fabulous daughter. And then page 225, I love you. I love you so much. And I love you, mother. You're the best thing that ever happened to me. My great act of inspiration. Well, I am like you. You are much better than I. Um, then, um, then notice how the, the emotions fluctuate. And on page 225, 225, um, Gloria gets to say, I'm getting tired of you. This charming mother you were acting out never says, I realize that. She says, you're marvelous, Gloria. And then immediately the reply is, you are marvelous, Gloria. Mm -hmm. Say something that is your own, something that I haven't suggested. You're a joy. What is happening? What, what, are, what are we observing in this new uh, daughter-mother relationship? What is it that we see? Uh, Jorge, what do you see? Okay, so then maybe she's getting more of things she requested. So she wants something different. But notice how, you know, we go back to the same because they're saying you're a joy. I feel like celebrating. What about you? Um, and notice page 26, here's to the best mother in the world. And then we talk about men, okay? And the, and the women uh, relationships to, to men. Um, um, but what kind, of, what kind of, how did the situation change? That's, that's my question, my basic question now. From one uh, role to the other. What could you say? What could we say? Kels. What kind of mother is this one? What kind of daughter we get now? Um, you're getting a... She, so since she said her birthday, she's getting the mother that she always wanted, you know? Yeah, but what kind of mother? A very supportive mother. Um, notice because, uh, okay, I want to make a point here. Notice that the first mother she also requested. So that's the kind of mother she wanted. And now we have a second ma mother that she also requested, it seems. Okay. So the mother that she always wanted, well, but here we have a, si a situation in which we have a person asking for mothers in the plural. She needs mothers, right? Um, so what we have, right, is, is an exaggeration of the situation, which again leads us to the idea, I guess, of absurdity. Um, Megan, in what, in what sense they would, this would be uh, an absurd relationship, mother, daughter, daughter, mother? Because I don't think it's very reasonable. Or at least I, a lot of people don't know any mother or daughters that would act like this with each other, especially on a birthday. Uh, yeah, how are they acting? Because you haven't said it. Um, was it? I was ahead, sorry. And it's just like, they're just so over the top, like lovey dovey, like just straight compliments that it's just kind of strange. Yes, and precisely it seems unrealistic, unrealistic. Um, and my, my little point here would be that 
um, for some reason, notice how uh, Gloria goes and says all of a sudden on page 225, I'm going to express it again. Say something that is your own, something that I have not suggested. Okay. Uh, so what is she questioning for me? She's questioning the script. Okay, somebody gave you a script and you're performing it. Can you please uh, get away from the script and tell me something that rings, you know, personal? But if it rings personal, then it must be more closer to, you know, closer to the truth of who you are and maybe who I am. Uh, and notice that hesitation in the play, okay, from please uh, be sure to play according to the script. And then this moment that when the script disintegrates, uh, you know, and then we have some voice saying, please act as the person you are, okay? And then notice how uh, the, 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 the play goes into, oh, acting again, right? Uh, as we were saying, here's to the best mother in the world and blah, blah, blah. And then we have the conversation about men. Let's see what they are saying about men for this second, um, second role. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, um, Kaylee and Lindsay to read, if you could, please. Page 226. Um, Gloria will, will substitute mother, will say, and Peter. Lindsay, you are substitute mother. Uh, substitute mother says, and Peter. And Kaylee, please uh, say, uh, read us, Gloria. Uh, do you want to start over here, Sylvester's mother? Um, uh, and Peter, when is he coming? Oh. And Peter, when is he coming? That's substitute mother. Oh, sorry. I'm like, I'm going to, so Peter? Yeah. Is something wrong with Peter, my love? No, there's nothing wrong. We were always confident. Don't hide anything from me. There's nothing to hide. But a few months ago, you told me Peter had powers. Yes, it's true. You seem to be in love. Oh, love? It doesn't last long. What a pity, huh? How have you and dad managed to be in love for so long? It's a miracle that still endures. Well, then let's say that with Peter, there was neither a miracle nor endurance. I must admit, I could see it coming. You seem to like Peter. Oh, yes. He's a nice guy. Besides, I know his parents very well. I had nothing against them. And if you loved him, there was nothing left to say, but... But? You're better than he is in every way, Gloria. You're more brilliant, more intelligent, more capable, more seductive. And to top it off, you are all you make it almost twice as much. That's very hard for a man to take. A competition is established, which isn't good. He needs a bimbo. You're special. We're still good friends. He must be devastated. No, just a little depressed. It's not easy losing someone like Gloria. Say it as though you really mean it. I paid a lot of money to hear this. Thanks. We can stop. I, Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, so, so the the relationship between the between Gloria and this uh, man didn't last too long, it seems, and. What I wonder, I don't know if you, if you do, but I wonder up to what extent this may be true, that relationships, love relationships, have not lasted very long for Gloria. Is the play hinting at the reality of Gloria? That maybe, you know, she's tried to make connections to men, but this man, uh, this, uh, these relationships have not worked out. 
because uh, we have that initial uh, role, then the, these relationships were not working out. And for this one, it didn't last too long. And it seems that the mother comes in to say, but it doesn't matter because you're, you're such a great woman. You earn a lot of money. It's is difficult for this man to take it, you know? Um, and, then, and then notice how the play circle backs back to something similar. Uh, what do I mean by this? Page 227, Gloria says, say it as though you really mean it, right? It's like a, the play is saying again, but go, go away from the script. But notice how contradictory and absurd the situation is. Like when she goes and say right away, uh, right after, I paid a lot of money to hear this. Okay, Why is, how is this absurd? I, I, I sense a, a full contradiction here in these two lines only. She just paid a lot of money for someone to say some nice things that she never got to hear from yeah. her mother. Yes, yes, indeed. And, but the funny thing is that the more he hear the, hears them, uh, the, more she, uh, the more she suspects um, they are just nice things that I paid you to say to me, but it's so contradictory because she says, you know, uh, I need for you to say them. I need for, for them to mean something because I paid for them. What is the contradiction here? Uh, the contradiction in my view is that how can they be uh, more felt, right? If you paid for them, there's no sincerity. This is acting out a script. And, but she goes and says, you know, um, uh, say it as though you really mean it. Oh, is she saying, fake it better? Mm -hmm. uh, because I paid for them. But the more she goes into, I need you to fake it well, the less real, right? All these things that she's paying for become. The question for me would be maybe, you know, more, more philosophically, if you, if you will, again, um, do we do that in our lives? Are we doing this? Are we paying for people to convey that kind of uh, uh, fake emotionality, if you will, uh, towards us? Is, are we engaged in these kinds of transactions in our daily lives that make, make our lives more absurd because they, are, they become less uh, meaningful, if you will? Have you found yourself in that kind of situation where because there is money in between, people start faking it, faking it from side to side, and you start faking it? Uh, what I'm trying to say with this question is that that's, that's up to extent um, an issue the play is taking on, okay? By revealing that in Latin America, say in a big city like Buenos Aires, this may be something that up to extent is happening, okay? In, every, in, in people's everyday lives. And for, for the playwright, it seems to me, um, um, this is irrational. This is, this is not making sense. But at the same time, I have to acknowledge the fact that it's not making sense, okay? This is our reality. Our reality is illogical, okay? Illogical. Now, she's not saying, notice one more thing. She's not saying that uh, reality uh, is uh, unreasonable for necessarily for men, because the viewpoint here is uh, of uh, female characters. So we're talking about female characters, right? and how these situa situations may be impacting their lives. Um, uh, I think that's, that's, that's what is happening uh, throughout the play. Now, uh, one question I would like to leave you with um, is, if I am a 30-year-old uh, woman, and truly today is my birthday, what do I, what do I need today, okay? What is it really that will make a difference, will, will, will make a difference for me 
as a, as a little human being uh, turning 30 today. Um, because that's also important for the play, okay? To be a woman, to be 30 years old, and have your birthday celebration, right? It's a celebration. Um, so we'll come back to this question and next time, next time for sure. Um, do you have any questions so far? Um, I wanted to say that uh, I wanted to actually show uh, a bit of uh, Roxanne Gay Gay's uh, amazing TED talk, but I decided to focus more on the play so that we get, you know, the basis of the play for us to start to finish a conversation next time around. But I just hope that I, I can show it maybe next time around. The th three of you already are participating in the discussion. You submitted your comments. And I today, this morning, I made sure to add comments and ask you questions. Um, because uh, we can connect that TED talk to the realities of women as presented in the plays. And that was my, my intention. And also to share with you uh, a more recent perspective regarding feminism, because not all femi we, we talk now nowadays, I guess, of feminisms in the plural, right? Feminisms. Um, so welcome back, okay? And have a great day. I'll see you Thursday. Thank you, Professor. Take care. Have a nice day, Professor. Thank you, you too. Bye, Jorge.